Okay, so uh, continuing on in our exploration of the first thing all our computers do, um, please a big hand for uh, Ilya's, Ilya's uh, been presenting here at Paxic. This is his third time. I call him one of the most dangerous men on the planet. Um, and Joseph is his first, his, his first time here presenting at Paxic. Please a big hand for these two. I've been given a little bit of a sneak preview. You know, we, uh, Andrea was talking about uh, the problems with file system parsing, and we had some questions about uh, file system and U-boot. And I think these guys are going to show you exactly how that works. Uh, hello. Uh, thank you for coming. This is uh, Boot to Root, uh, auditing uh, bootloaders by example. Um, so I am uh, Joseph Tartaro, I'm an uh, Associate Principal Security Consultant at IOActive. I am Ilya uh, Mosbudel, uh, I work for Joe, I'm the Director of Penetration Testing at IOActive. Uh, so basically the, the audience that we expect uh, for this presentation are people like uh, embedded systems engineers, uh, security folks that deal with low-level devices and secure boot stuff, or just uh, generally curious people that uh, want to learn a little bit about this stuff and uh, dive into it. And uh, hopefully some of this will inspire you to, to go further and have it no longer be this secret black box. And uh, so the quick agenda, uh, we're going to discuss uh, quote-unquote bootloaders, um, why it's a concern, and uh, some of the common bootloaders we looked at, the open source projects we audited, and uh, their interesting supported features. Uh, we're going to cover the attack surface because there appears to be a lot of attack surface that people don't realize. Um, and then the examples of bugs uh, in the attack surface and then our conclusions. So, uh, quote unquote bootloaders. Um, we're using kind of like a wide interpretation. Uh, we're basically more or less talking about uh, various things uh, in your boot chain that could be compromised. And if you've never really uh, toyed with this stuff, you can kind of think of it like uh, user land and kernel space. You're writing code in user land and you try to reach into kernel space to do things. Uh, similar here, you're going to have code running in bootloader land and we'll talk to you kind of like a secure world or reference uh, BIOS calls or UV calls, things along those lines. So um, you'll have things like system management mode and stuff that you're reaching into, which is the prime target. and. Uh, Hopefully that, that kind of makes sense to uh, chain it all together. Um, so why? Uh, if you were here for Andreas' talk, you should <laughs> understand it a little bit. But uh, basically, um, it's it's a key foundation, secure foundation for your chain of trust. If you find a find a bug and you can get code execution um, earlier in the chain, you can uh, you know basically compromise everything past that. Um, because all, all the security is ensured by uh, what happens before it. So, um, another concern is uh, a lot of device uh, engineers basically are poor at uh, hardening their devices and limiting the attack surface. And what we mean by that are people who build a device and they include a, a network stack, but they don't actually use it. Like all you're doing is giving an attacker a lot of attack surface. There's there's no reason for you to have that. So why why have it? And uh, also engineers uh, tend to underestimate reverse engineering. They they kind of think that it's a black box and nobody's going to see it, and they kind of leave it that way. But um, it, it's a concern that people should be aware of. And a little story behind how this presentation even happened was. Ilya and I were actually on a train to a baseball game, and uh, we were looking at a device that had U-boot, and pulled out our, our phone and started looking at some code, and quickly uh, became shocked because we stumbled into like 13 bugs, like on the train ride, and went, oh my god, <laughs> we should we should probably look at this and a bunch of other ones, and in about 20 minutes we put together a, an agenda for a presentation and basically spawned this on, on the train ride. So, um, really quick, to uh, give credit where credit's due, uh, this is a list of uh, people who basically inspired us in, in this realm, and uh, these are all people that you should uh, kind of look up and, and check out some of the work they've done, because uh, they've done some really cool things, and nothing that we're, we're doing is uh, 
necessarily new. We're not the first to look at this stuff, and uh, we're not the last. So, so secure boot. Um, Andreas Koch covered a lot of this stuff. Uh, basically, you have a, a train of trust and a whole bunch of different stages, things like measure boot, trust boot, and uh, then you'll have things like a TPM involvement, and then something like trust zone, and then a operating system that interacts with these things. So basically, uh, the goal is to break it earlier on so you can affect everything else, but that's, that's the entire window that we're looking at. And where do you see these things? Uh, everywhere. Uh, basically, every, every device, servers, desktops, your phones, your game consoles, your TV, uh, everything has this stuff. And um, there's always going to be a dependency on it, so it, it really, really does matter. So um, common bootloaders, we basically limited ourselves to uh, publicly available open source projects. Um, all of these are used in the real world. It's uh, realistic, but every device is uh, heavily customized. So you might run into a device that has a ton of uh, custom hardware drivers, for example, and, and different things. So we're, we're clearly not going to see that in, in the base code. So when you decide to go out of the device on your own, that's going to be all like fresh attack surface for you to look at. Um, but in the base code, uh, this is a list of what we, we covered. U-boot, Coreboot, Grub, CBIOS, uh, CAFE, which is Broadcoms, uh, iPixie, and then uh, Tianacore. So, um, and I apologize, this is a little dry. We're basically going to go over each one and the interesting features and uh, why we're looking at them. But U-Boot, uh, uh, as you can see, it's, uh, it's extremely common. I think earlier we said a billion devices, <laughs> basically, um, have U-Boot, and it um, basically supports a, a wide range of ports and CPUs, and that's, that's why it's so popular. And you'll see that there's the, a ton of, or massive, massive configuration file where people can tweak, tweak everything about this, and uh, a lot of people like to leave it relatively default. And, um, uh, it has a, a pretty powerful shell, so if you ever looked at a uh, UFI uh, shell, it, it has a very similar one with uh, people integrating different features. You'll uh, find issues like basic command injections and stuff, um, but there's a little bit of tech surface there and, and some fun stuff to look at, and then lots and lots and lots of device drivers. Uh, it supports a, a network stack with a bunch of different protocols, some different file systems, and a lot of uh, different uh, methods of loading, loading your file systems through all these different devices, and some of them are very archaic and probably worth looking into, like disk on chip and stuff, and uh, yeah, it's extremely popular. So uh, Core Boot, uh, this one is targeted at modern operating systems. Uh, it does not support legacy BIOS calls. So um, you'll find in Corbu code, they'll, they'll never have a network stack, for example. If, if you need a network stack, you need to boot into something, they, they just expect you to boot into a Lightpixie. Or uh, if you need to do legacy uh, BIOS calls, they expect you to boot uh, CBIOS, for example. Uh, they're not actually taking on those features. So uh, they did a good job at kind of limiting the attack surface. Um, these are used in Chromebooks and uh, the more interesting parts come kind of from, from Google, obviously. And uh, one, one interesting thing to note about this is Corbett actually has a system management mode. And in Grub, I'm sure everyone here is familiar with Grub, uh, its primary concern is multi-boot spec. So it handles a whole uh, slew of file systems. So uh, this is kind of uh, your interesting uh, attack surface, all these different file system parsers here. And uh, there are also UFI signed versions of Grub. And uh, the reason that matters is because if you can go ahead and take a uh, secure boot chain that involves UFI and load a vulnerable version of Grub that is signed and trigger a bug in it, now, now you're good to go. And CBIOS. Uh, so this is uh, kind of like the legacy BIOS calls that we talked about. Um, for example, Core Boot will, will load this up. Um, it, it gets loaded by a ton of different uh, bootloaders that basically want to support those features. 
it uh, supports TPM, which is a trusted platform module, and it's also the compatibility support module for UV and OVMF. And then uh, CAFE, this is Broadcom's boot loader. You're going to see this in all sorts of uh, networking devices and uh, TVs, uh, stuff like that. Um, it's, it is open source um, and uh, has a network stack that's an uh, interesting attack surface. And I can see uh, basically uh, same thing with the, the network uh, attack surface, but you'll notice that IPXE supports uh, uh, way more uh, protocols than any other bootloader you'll look at. So um, that's that's the more interesting aspect. And uh, another example is uh, there are UV signed versions of this as well. <coughs> and then uh, ultimately uh, Tiano port, which is uh, EDK2 and, and UV. It's um, needs no introduction, everybody has, has looked at this, has spent a ton, a ton of research over the last 15 years, um, a lot of interesting work. Um, it's, it's by far the most scrutinized and attacked, so it's uh, definitely the most mature out of all of them, but um, it's also because it's probably the most, most used. And um, you'll also find that other uh, implementations are, are based on Tiana for things like if you're looking at an Android device that has a Qualcomm uh, Android bootloader or extended bootloader that's all built on top of Tiana Core. And then uh, there's some things related to bootloaders. So you'll have stuff like the Trust Zone OS. Um, those are kind of like the secure world components we were talking about where you it's a good attack surface because you're calling from, imagine like user land into kernel land, you're, you're in this normal land trying to call into these secure realms. So if you have code execution in there, uh, you, you basically won and uh, and then the, the host OS, um, it, it can have some interaction with the bootloader. It can do things like modify the uh, NVRAM for environment variables, things along those lines. Uh, so this is just a, a slide for you guys to reference later, take a picture or something, but uh, it's just a quick link for uh, two source code and instructions for building each project. So if you want to build a quick uh, audit environment and, and focus some of the stuff, uh, it's just a quick uh, way to get started. Cool. Uh, so uh, let's get into the attack surface. So uh, a lot of the common attack surface that we saw across the board is um, we broke it up to NVRAM, which uh, was the, the area that we saw people storing things like environment variables, which are user controlled, uh, files and file system parsing. Uh, network stacks, uh, various buses, and uh, system man uh, management mode, as well as uh, DMA and, uh, and hardware attacks. So I'll quickly getting to, into uh, NVRAM, uh, like I said, environment variables, uh, these things can be modified uh, from the OS runtime or uh, physically modified uh, uh, at a hardware level. Uh, it's generally stored on, on a separate piece of hardware, but I think in some, some environments it's like on disk and stuff. Um, but uh, but you, you kind of have your standard concerns. These are uh, user controlled, attacker controlled, and a lot of people will just kind of assume assume that it's not. So if you uh, look at some of the source for these projects, you'll see these uh, common calls like environment gets, get environment, uh, et cetera. And um, if you wanted to go and audit the source code a little bit, Every single time you see this call reaching into an environment variable, you just you just simply look how are, how are they handling the data, and if they're not handling it in a secure manner, but you have a bug there. So, a uh, quick explanation or a quick example is uh, inside uBoot, you can see uh, the red square that was just uh, highlighted. It does an environment git call for boot p vci, and this environment variable is then checked if it exists. And if it does exist, it passes it to this put BCI function. And once it gets past the put BCI, it simply does a stir length uh, check, or a stir length uh, on it, and then passes it to my copy. Uh, there's no sort of validation on if uh, it could fit inside the buffer or not, and that you have a, a basic uh, stack mesh there. And uh, this is kind of what we were talking about when we were on the train, and we went, oh god. <laughs> like, uh, so I saw examples like this, and. You know, we should really kind of look at this. Um, uh, another example, environment get to a host name. 
that is, as soon as that thing just does stir length and passes it straight to a buffer without checking. And uh, as you can see, uh, it's, it's uh, consistent. Uh, we have a 128 byte buffer here, and uh, same exact thing. It's just a stir copy straight to that buffer. And uh, keep in mind that I believe the default size for environment variables is 512 bytes. Um, uh, but uh, some configuration files will go even higher, like uh, text 2,000 bytes, x 8,000 bytes. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so you can see there's a, a lot of examples here, uh, a lot of stuff to look at, and it just keeps happening everywhere. Um, so to, uh, to give you a quick, um, a quick look at how, how trivial this stuff is, if you wanted to start poking at this stuff, is uh, just real quick. It's nothing more than you know booting up U-boot, and in this case, the uh, the code we pointed out uh, happens when uh, it does like DHCP, for example. So we just set up these two environment variables by home called DHCP, and, and it crashes. And uh, you know, quickly look, and you can see uh, we control a handful of registers and and whatnot. So. Uh, if, you, if you've never looked at this stuff and it is kind of black box to you, but you think it would be interesting, you can kind of see there's like a low barrier of entry, uh, similar to what Andrea said in this last presentation. Um, some of the quality of code and things you're running into are, you know, things that you'd see 15, 20 years ago. So um, it'd be good practice for you to basically start poking up. Uh, yeah, so uh, if you uh, were paying attention to the questions uh, when Andreas was talking, there was a small discussion about file systems, and I was thinking, oh, that's interesting, because about half an hour from now, I'm going to be talking about this, and sure enough, here I am. Um, so uh, as Andrea uh, correctly pointed out, one of the uh, mass attack surfaces in a uh, secure boot environment is your file system, because the thing needs to boot in order to boot, needs to read files and data, and needs to get that from uh, a device and that has a file system, so you need to parse the file system before you can get to the files. Um, so uh, the first thing you do is you have to mount your file system somehow, uh, that in includes you know, reading a bunch of uh, blocks and things like that, and uh, store things around, and keep things in memory, and sort of parsing certain things. Um, uh, depending on which environment you're in and which file system you're using, and, and, uh, uh, your file system may or may not be signed or integrity protected. Uh, usually, um, depending on your environment, some are, some aren't, uh, but usually you can get something going where um, it isn't signed, or you have to mount up to a certain point before you can do a bunch of verification. Um, so often your file system has lots and lots and lots of tax surface. Um, a simple example, for example, is you know a, a, a FAT file system on a USB device. Even though FAT is one of the more uh, one of the uh, less complex file systems and, and sort of well known, well tested, well uh, worn out file system. So there's usually less bugs in your FAT file system. Uh, there's usually more bugs in other file systems. Um, so because of that, obviously, this is a, a prior tax surface. Um, obviously, once you mount your file system, um, you have to actually get to your files. Um, and again, as was pointed out earlier, um, some files will be integrity protected and they might be encrypted. Uh, but uh, depending on your boot environment uh, and, and the work situation, uh, some files may not be uh, uh, encrypted or integrity protected. And so parsing of those files, uh, obviously, uh, is also an interesting tax surface. And I would say a, a prime example, a prime tax surface. Um, and those file parsers should absolutely be considered tax surface. Um, so I'll be showing some examples of uh, <laughs> some X2 and Grub um, for the file system stuff. Uh, but in terms of files, I mean, this could be anything, right? Where if you're reading a driver from a file system or a binary or a partition table or a capsule update or a, a, a bitmap splash image, um, and the splash images are usually never signed because you want to be able to customize those kind of things. Um, and I'll, I'll demo some, some of that as well. But what I'd like to show about. Um, so I, I hope you can read this, but um, basically this is a grub when it's parsing X2 uh, symlinks, it basically does reads a symlink, and this right here does, uh, reads, it takes this uh, size that I read from the file system, and it does plus one, so the, device is the, the size is really big, it's uh, 0 x ff, 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 plus one, that means zero, and so uh, grub malloc basically allows an alloc of zero, it gives you a valid, po a valid pointer to a piece of memory that can hold zero bytes. Um, so that works. And then once you get the valid pointer back, it calls a, 
a grub 2 x 2 degree file, and it gives it, you know, here's the pointer, here's that really big length, which is 4 gigs. Um, and what's really, really nice about this file API is that it goes, oh, well, the file is only 1,000 bytes. And instead of uh, copying 4 gigs, we'll just only copy 1,000 bytes into this buffer that can only hold 0 bytes. Uh, and so this is your very uh, standard trivial uh, buffer overflow um, that where you can basically, even though the size is 4 gigs, you can actually control ac the actual amount that gets copied, and you control all of the bytes that get copied into it. Um, so this obviously allows for a uh, compromise of a signed grub. Um, another example, uh, it would be, uh, bit, uh, so that's the splash bit master example. This is an example in Teotihuacan Core and Eufy, uh, that was very, very recently fixed and was found by multiple parties independently. Um, <clears throat> I can't comment on some of the parties, uh, but some of those people may be around here. Um, so this is basically the idea is that if you have a, a very simple uh, four or eight bit bitmap, the idea is that every bit gets a palette, and so if you have a four bit bitmap, uh, your palette can have up to 16 colors. And so they have this array of 16 bytes in which they copy the palette, uh, but you can basically create a, a corrupted uh, four bit uh, bitmap where your palette is bigger than 16 bytes, and they just copy the entire palette into this 16 byte buffer. Um, and then the same thing happens for the eight, eight, uh, the eight bit uh, bitmaps. Um, so uh, this was in Ufy for a long time, and this fixed maybe two months ago, three months ago, something like that, right? Um, so up to recently, this uh, this got you a, a, a Ufy break. Um, so that's it, sort of a, a quick overview of files and file systems. And these, this is just a tip of the iceberg. There are many, many, many more. Uh, but since we're not going to stop with file systems, let's move on. Let's uh, now that we've done the environment stuff, that we've looked at uh, the file systems. Let's look at the remote attack surface of bootloaders. Um, so uh, it's very common for uh, a bunch of bootloaders to have a network stack for some reason. Um, usually, uh, it'll have your entire TCP/IP stack. It'll support, you know, Ethernet and IP and TCP and UDP and ICMP and you know, all, the, all those low-level uh, protocols. And then, of course, they're pretty useless if you're not using actual services. So usually, they'll on top of that, they'll do things like UDP and DHCP and DNS and uh, iSCSI and NFS and IPsec as corporate environments, um, and HTTP and HTTPS and TTP and so forth. Uh, and you'll see these things re-implemented a whole bunch of uh, um, whole bunch of different uh, uh, bootloaders. Um, uh, so, common observations in general is uh, when you're looking at low-level TCP/IP stuff, um, essentially at a very high level, these protocols are basically TLVs, right, or type-like value. And uh, as we all know, when you start fuzzing stuff, when you see TLV, uh, denial of services, denial. Of, so if you're looking at TLV, then uh, denial of services are incredibly common. You'll see things like endless loops and out of bound reads and things like that. Um, this has plagued every network stack no demand, uh, and that includes all the network stacks uh, in, your, in, a, in a secure boot chain. Um, on top of that, you'll see things like DNS and DHCP. Uh, and there's these uh, sort of very, very old, very well-known uh, DNS and DHCP games where you can start spoofing stuff. And the idea is um, generally you try to fix these things by introducing some randomness in IDs. Um, this is a well-known concept that's been around for a long time. Um, all the bootloaders re-implement this code from the 1980s, and they all make the same class of mistakes. Um, on top of that, obviously, um, is these things are parsing a bunch of blobs and binary data that come to the network. Um, there are memory corruption bugs. And then last but not least, you'll see uh, info leaks, you know, something like partly or easily or something like that. Um, that shows up with some regularity. Um, so for so let's take a look at that uh, U-Boot DNS. Um, this is really nice because the DNS ID is one. It is always one for every, every DNS packet which means uh, doing spoofing and intercepting is extremely trivial because the DNS ID is always one. Um, so uh, looking at uh, CAFE's uh, DHCP reply parser, for example, it has this 128 byte stack buffer, and then it uh, goes and reads uh, a UN8, which can go from 0 to 255, and then it'll take that length field and copy from the network up to 255 bytes into the chunk buffer, which is 128. So this this is your your absolute classic stack smash. Um, this stuff is not compiled with stack protector. Um, so this is a, a, 
like 90 style pre op low stack smash. Um, this this is this is used like skewed roots over at this point. Uh, another cafe example. This is TFP. Um, it's it's the same thing, right? It's, in this case, it's a 512 byte buffer that's in a structure, um, and then they copy into it, and the amount of data they copy into it, which is, is the max that fits in one of these eBuff structures, which uh, it, this doesn't show here, but it's it's capped by the Ethernet MTU, which is about 1500. Um, so again, trivial memory corruption bug right here. Um, here's another one. This is in, in their, uh, their uh, RCP ping handler, where it has this, you send a ping and it's waiting for a response, and it has this loop, and it has a timeout where if after a certain amount of time I don't receive the right packet, I bail out. And so every time it gets a packet in the loop, it says, looks at the magic ID and goes, oh, is this the packet I'm looking for? Oh no, free, and then wait for the next one, wait for the next one. Um, there's a weird port of case where it sees a packet and then goes, oh, not the one I'm doing, it frees, but it doesn't set the packet to null. And then once it goes back in the while loop, it goes, oh, timed out. And then at the end of the while loop, it frees the thing again. So this, this is your classic double free and use after free. Um, this is this, this takes an effort to exploit and trigger, uh, but it, it's very, very classic. Uh, and then another cat, because why not CAFI, why not IP, why? You know, another interesting one, this is uh, the CAFI, the standard IP input uh, parser. And it uh, looks at your, um, uh, at your uh, the, the length inside of your um, IP, inside your IP header that, that sort of describes your content, and it doesn't validate at all. It just trusts it, and then it starts uh, setting its buffers based on that length. So if you uh, make that length really small, it triggers an initial underflow, and so uh, that will lead to things like you know thinking there's four gigs of data that arrived, even though you know your buffer can only it only has like 20 bytes in it. Or it can have things like uh, when you make it really big, um, and then that can lead to out of bound reads and out of bound writes. Um, but enough of uh, these fancy stuff. I know, and there's plenty more bugs where I come from. As I said, again, this is just the tip of the iceberg. You start with these Googlers, and the, I mean, U U boot is not the exception. U boot is more like the rule. Most other bootloaders are <laughs> of a similar kind of code quality. Um, but let's uh, let, let, let's okay. I'll be done with HTTP, But let's still. What's the let, next step in, in sort of the remote attack surface? Um, so some bootloaders actually support Wi-Fi and 802.11. Um, when it comes to this stuff, there's sort of because uh, they have to talk to radio, and there's sort of two kinds of radios, right? You have the radio that has a lot of uh, a very thick firmware that basically takes all the frames, but it does a lot of pre-validation in the radio. And then it'll over SDIO or USB or whatever talks to your uh, your boot chain and says, "Here's the packets." Um, and then there's the other kind of radio, which is basically just uh, it, it's it's like pass through. It so it takes frames from the from the air and doesn't do anything. It just passes it uh, to your uh, secure boot. Um, from per for the purposes of, of sort of this discussion, we are basically assuming that second kind of radio where there's no validation on the radio. Um, as to whether or not that happens or not, very much depends upon which radio you're using. Um, the other thing is that 802.11 is not as common yet in bootloaders. I did, this sort of gives you the, uh, the, the philosophical between is this sort of accidental attack surface reduction or purposeful attack surface reduction. Um, my guess is accidental, whereas people haven't implemented the features yet, but at some point they might. Um, and then sort of the optimist in me likes to hope that, well, maybe it's purposeful. Maybe they, they consider 811 and they discarded it. Uh, unfortunately, uh, reality uh, has shown me kind of, and again, usually it's the first and not the last. Um, but uh, one of the, uh, um, one of, one of the bootloaders that does support 811 is iPixie. And this is one of the decryption routines where if you give it a, a zero sized piece of data to decrypt, it basically does uh, length. Uh, Divided by eight, zero by eight. zero divided by eight is zero. It does minus one, and AAS unwrap does uh, in memory um, uh, transformations, so decrypt in memory. Uh, because you give it a length of minus one, it'll do in memory decryption of four bits of data, which obviously uh, um, triggers memory corruption. Uh, now this is kind of you know it'll trigger a crash, but try to explain this is going to be a pain in the ass. However, this one is your classic SSID parser bug. 
uh, where, <laughs> yep, yep, that's the one, the 90s called. <laughs> um, <laughs> so you get this IE that comes over over the year, and you start parsing it, and you go, oh yeah, well, here's the IE element, and then you take the IE element length, and you pop it into an SSID, which is 32 bytes, even though your uh, length can be up to 255, and then this is a straight up stack smash. Um, this is that's straight up, S this is even before you're connected, so it's straight up SSID into a stack buffer um, with uh, no stack cookies, smashes straight into it, and you can override the uh, safe instruction filter. Um, and then, uh, so those are some of the bugs we found, and I went out and looked for like or some recent stuff that other people looked at, and so this is a recent CV that came out a few months ago from Qualcomm in some Android stuff. Um, and then here's another one that was found by the little Android team in some of their WLAN stuff. Um, so this is just to show that like the, the, like the bugs we found are unique. There are plenty of these things go around, uh, and, and they're in your boot chain. Um, so, okay, so now we've done you know, the TCIP stuff and the high-level services and the 811, so what's left? Okay, well, Bluetooth. Um, and first of all, you go, well, why Bluetooth? Well, it turns out um, there is, so, when you're talking Bluetooth for uh, boot chains, it's it's uh, because there are some boot environments where you want to have HID devices, so you may want to have a keyboard or a, a mouse, um, and you know, obviously they can use Bluetooth, and so um, some boot environments will support Bluetooth. Um, now the good news is, in terms of uh, ac uh, accidental or purposeful attack surface reduction, um, most boot environments do not, and that's great because at least you don't have to boot the attack surface. Um, uh, we did, we did see one earlier, a, a boot environment earlier this year that had a really big Bluetooth stack with numerous, numerous Bluetooth bugs. Um, and based on that, sort of, um, just if you look at the protocol at high level, it's, so the, the low level L, L2 cap type stuff in Bluetooth, which is sort of the L2 stuff where the, all the other stuff are layered on top, uh, is um, basically it's, it's a, it, can use, it can use fragmentation. And the idea is the lengths are all U in 16s, which means uh, once everything sort of gets reassembled, it can be you can have a frame that is up to about 65,000 bytes, um, and so that basically opens you up to a whole bunch of these you know 90 style fragmentation games. And sure enough, we, you know we didn't learn unless with T2 had beat, we did in Bluetooth as well. Tons and tons of fragmentation show up. Uh, you have really large fragments or really short fragments. Something that doesn't fragment right or something that doesn't like in, in the middle. You know. Things go bad, and they go bad really fast. Um, if you're lucky, it's a dial service. If you're not lucky, it'll be memory corruption. Um, as I said, this doesn't show up in much boot environments. So I, I was desperately looking for an example in open source. I couldn't find it because they don't support it. Not a single one we look at, unfortunately. Um, I wish I could show you the one the ones we did have, but those are covered by non-disclosure agreements. Um, so basically, instead, um, we looked at some of, uh, recently fixed bugs in a uh, bunch of uh, Android stuff. So this is a, a Qualcomm driver, and this is a remotely triggerable where basically if you're doing an authentication at the same time you disconnect, there's this weird remote race condition where if you do the disconnect before the application, the application then happens, um, the, module, the, the device is already deleted, but the function pointer on it is still called. So now you have a function for something that no longer exists. Uh, and this, this can lead to remote code execution, basically. Um, this was uh, found by uh, Qualcomm, and this was, I think, in August Android um, update? Yeah. Um, and then here's another one. This was another one. Um, uh, this was leads to a real pointer. Uh, but my point is, even though we couldn't find a bootloader that had a boot stuff, uh, there definitely is a Bluetooth stuff in a bunch of uh, like Android-type devices. Uh, and they absolutely have uh, security bugs. Um, so having covered, so now we've covered N, and we've done the files and the files and the little network stuff. Uh, so then we're, uh, Joe and I were like, well, okay, what, what's the next attack surface that's interesting in Secure Boot? Uh, and we were both like, well, obviously USB. And the reason uh, why we say USB is because uh, there are a handful of scenarios that are very common in a boot, in a boot environment where you use USB. Uh, so obviously HID device, right? Mouse and keyboard, um, uh, things like fast booked, um, things like you know recovery mode, and stuff like oh you know I want to boot this image off a USB stick, right? So those are the four common scenarios, and most uh, uh, boot chains, even secure boot chains, 
will support at least one of these four, if not multiple. Uh, and in order to do that, you have to have a USB stack. Um, and uh, we bought quite a few USB stacks over the last year. Uh, and I can tell you, nobody does it right. Uh, these are things that easily break. Um, it, it's, uh, uh, so USB is this thing which is, like it's almost packet protocol based. It looks a lot like it. And it's these things where once you, you plug the thing in and uh, the host sort of gets a notification of it and goes, oh, okay, well, I need information about who you are. And it says, basically, you send me this descriptor, this descriptor, this descriptor, which tells me about what kind of device you are. Uh, and so the, basically your host OS, for this case, your boot chain, has to parse all of these descriptors that come in from your USB device. And it turns out that uh, parsing descriptors isn't always very easy, and it's usually not done with a lot of care. Um, the two sort of generally types of bugs that we've seen here are A, just straight up overflows, where you have static arrays of like, well, the spec says you can have up to eight interfaces. Uh, no way a device would ever send you a descriptor that has nine interfaces, even though it's just an extra bit, you know. Um, so uh, straight up overflows, very common. The other one, which is kind of sort of unique to USB, or, or sort of is this sort of a, 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 a case of, is uh, you have all of these double fetches. Uh, because of the way descriptors work is, um, so descriptors are this thing where they, you have a small, depending on which descriptor, two or four byte header, and then it has a bunch of content. Uh, now, because they're variable length content, your host never knows exactly how big they are because the device gets to set how big it is. So the way it works is the host goes to the device and says, give me the first four bytes of your descriptor, which I know is your header. And then the device goes to the host and says, here's the first four bytes. And the first four bytes contain a two byte length field in there, like W total length or something like that. And then the host does an alloc based on that. And then it goes back to the device and says, okay, give me that same descriptor, but now give me the header and all that, uh, all the length after it, the length after it based on length you gave me. Um, and so it rereads re that header, puts it in the buffer, and then hands that back off to a caller. The problem is if between the first and the second fetch, you, the length in the descriptor changes, and you don't catch it, um, you, you'll have a descriptor that has a, a length field that has not or was validated the first time, but not the second time. And because of double fetch, it overwrites the first one, and so you end up parsing something with a length field that's not validated. This is extremely common. I've seen every single um, USB stack break on this. Um, you can write a test case for this and you'll see stuff uh, blow up instantly. Um, so again, let's go to Grub. Grub obviously has uh, uh, <clears throat> handles USB, and it goes and gets a descriptor, and then the descriptor basically has a configuration count, and it basically has a for loop that moves from zero up to configuration count, um, and it adds into this uh, device configuration index I, and then it puts stuff into it. Uh, now that is something that is statically defined as an eight as eight elements, uh, but I can make a config count that's nine or ten up to two fifty five from the device, and this will uh, this will trigger memory corruption. Uh, and of course, we're not done yet. There's also a number of interfaces, uh, which is also statically defined um, in Grub, um, and there's no bound check on this. So if you make number of interfaces up to like two fifty five or something, uh, there'll be a second memory corruption bug right there. So that's a two for one. Um, Tiago Core, so this is Yuffie. Um, recently also had um, some USB fixes that were applied. This also happened two or three months ago. Uh, but the idea was basically, you know, it was this similar thing where it does the first fetch and then it takes two, two bytes and then it does the second fetch with that link and it copies into it. And this, in this case, this link is, uh, is a, a UN8, so it's up to 256. And so uh, they didn't add a bound check here, but what they did is they looked at the caller and they changed the buffer size. So that hub desk is coming in out, and it's now uh, a UN8 array of up to 256, and then they uh, cast a pointer to it. Um, and that sort of implicitly fixes this bug. Um, and, uh, okay. And then, so uh, CBIOS says, as a so in looking, talking about these double fetches, CBIOS has this classic one where this one goes to USB and says, hey, we'll go get me, the, get, we'll get me a config descriptor. Um, and then the config descriptor has this W total length field, and then it goes and it allocs it and goes, oh, go get me this config descriptor again. And now the config W total length 
uh, can be different from the CFG WW total lights. And if there's a mismatch, that means whoever starts handling that, because uh, uh, that config gets returned, and so the W total length can uh, now no longer uh, correctly describe the actual buffer length. Um, and that, uh, the users of this function, uh, can, they can trigger um, uh, out-of-bound reads and out-of-bound writes. Um, so just to show that, uh, it, so the, this is a plug we didn't find. Um, but this is, for example, uh, U uh, USB as an attack surface is uh, how the Nintendo Switch uh, got uh, uh, jailbroken uh, last year. So this is for very early on in the, uh, um, the recovery mode in the boot run of Nintendo Switch. There was basically uh, you could um, basically uh, get it to go to go to this recovery mode, and then you could uh, plug in a USB device and basically uh, give it this very particular uh, get status uh, request. Uh, and what it would do is it would take a link that you gave it, a UN16, and then it would take that UN16 and it would copy into this quote unquote DMA buffer. And without any length validation, the DNA buffer was considerably shorter than uh, 64K, and so you could use this to reliably uh, smash memory. And in fact, this was used to, uh, to, to root the Nintendo Switch. Ah, uh, there we go. Yes, okay. So, okay, we've, uh, so once with the USB, okay, then you sort of ask the question and go, oh, well, um, what about the other buses? Well, you know, that's obviously a tax surface too. Um, you could certainly say anything that's not DMA can easily be a tax surface from a um, skew boot point of view. Um, and so if one example is it flashes off the technical risk BI, and depending on what you're doing, uh, your flash may not be uh, may not be trusted, or parts of your flash may not be trusted, and basically anything connected over the SPI shouldn't be trusted. Um, but there's you know other buses and things like that. So for example, uh, your TPM is often connected over uh, LPC or SPI, um, and uh, unless you're using uh, your, your two-spec reach a lot, the data that comes in over the your uh, LPC or SPI bus for TPM shouldn't be trusted. Um, and this, there was a, a good presentation by the guys from NCC, I think two years ago, about all of these sort of TPM uh, uh, partial bugs. Um, and uh, yeah, um, the, your bootloaders are no different. Um, yeah, Linux breaks and Windows breaks and, and UFI breaks, but also C BIOS breaks, uh, where you know, it takes a length field, but it actually tries to validate it. But it only looks at the upper bound and not the lower bound. And it's sort of a variable length data structure. And so if you give it a length that's really, really small, small smaller than the header, um, it will basically take that length and then subtract the header length. So you end up with a really, really large value, uh, which is now in your size. That's on the float, something really big. And then it turns out, if you look at CBIOS, uh, malloc high actually has an internal integer overflow. So now you give it, you underfloat something really big, and then you give it really big to malloc high, which basically gives you back a pointer of zero size length. Uh, and then uh, that length is used, the, the original, the, the, your underfloat really big values used to copy into that very small buffer. Um, and uh, it, the malloc high the implementation is, is, is um, because it's pretty complicated, but like you can take my word for it that it, it, it has an it has an overflow in there. Uh, but I'll quickly run over this. But this part isn't very important. But the, the code is kind of hard to follow. But basically, you know, the malloc high calls malloc, which calls uh, uh, malloc padlock, and then malloc padlock calls malloc new. And malloc new has this thing where they have this uh, linked list of sort of uh, chunks of data that describe something that is. Uh, partially allocated has some free space, and it has this, you know, uh, begin pointer and end pointer, and sort of uh, where the allocate, where the stuff is allocated, and then the rest of it is unallocated. Uh, and then it does uh, uh, some map based on the side you give it with a line down. And anyway, I don't really have the time to run through this, um, but feel free to take a picture of it or look at this later. Uh, th th there's absolutely a bug in here. Uh, it's in that red box. <laughs> I'll leave this. You know, I'll leave this exercise. Um, uh, whoever, whoever, uh, whoever uh, by the time I'm done, can explain the bug to me, I'll give you 100 bucks. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> was it, was it, you want me to go back? Was it not enough time? Mm -hmm. just, just real quick, just to get emphasis on, on that region. Um, one thing that we kind of notice is that uh, designers and developers, if it's, um, 
you know, something on this weird bus and on a device or a component that an end user should never actually be using a standard use case, they they kind of just inherently trust it, which is an issue. They don't actually consider it uh, uh, potentially dangerous. Uh, that's just a common thing that we've seen across the board. Okay, so uh, so the next sort of attack surface is, is uh, things like system management mode and, and trust so. So when I take six, there's SMM. Uh, if you don't know what that is, there have been you know, there's a decade and a half worth of security research on this. Some of it presented at Kansas and PACSEC. Really, really interesting stuff. I'm not going to go too deep into these specifics, but my, the point I'm trying to make is S implementing SMM and implementing it right is very, very hard. Intel has tried to do this uh, for a decade and a half, uh, and it's this arms race where somebody finds a break, they improve it, somebody else finds another break, they improve it. This is a game that's been going on for a decade and a half. Uh, they've gotten a pretty good grasp on things. On occasion, there's still some breaks usually in the third party stuff, but Intel at this point has got a pretty good grasp on it. Um, and so if you look at the SMM implementation in, in, in uh, UFI and Tiano Core, like, you're, you're pretty good. I mean, not saying it's without its flaws, but it's pretty decent. Uh, now, if you're gonna do an x86 bootloader, you're gonna do SMM, and you're gonna re-implement the stuff uh, from scratch, you are in deep, deep trouble, because this stuff is really hard to get right. You are definitely gonna screw it up the first 10 times. <laughs> um, which is what Core Boot does. <laughs> so corporate installs this as a min handler, and to their credit, they go, oh, you know what, before we look at the data you give us, we range check, um, and then, oops, uh, the range check basically says to do. <laughs> it just says return okay. Um, so you can give it any pointer, and then you can basically get it to read and write to uh, SMM over memory on your behalf, uh, and that absolutely works. Yeah, I'm, uh, because we're running out of time, and Andrea did such a great uh, uh, job to talk about trust, so I'm just going to skip over this. Okay. And <laughs> we're running out of time, so I'm going to skip over the host of stuff as well. Um, so okay, let me let me talk about last last piece I want to talk about, which is uh, uh, DMA, which is uh, 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 memory uh, access. And again, uh, Andrea brought this up as well. Uh, but basically, if you are really serious about having a secure boot. Um, you can't just have unfettered DMA access, even though that is the way stuff was originally designed. You've got to do something about it. Um, a lot of the uh, bootloaders, especially when you look at the open source stuff, haven't really gotten a handle on this yet. Um, if you're making a bootloader and, and you're at least thinking about DMA attacks, you are at the present time ahead of the curve. Um, that's not to say some people haven't, absolutely. I mean, uh, UFI now has support for this stuff. If you look at CSMA, it has support for this. Um, there was a, a, a talk a few weeks ago about the design of um, the Xbox uh, security system where they uh, talk in depth about sort of the DMA controller that does memory encryption integrity stuff. So some people have designed around this. Um, and, and one of the uh, points that was sort of made in the Xbox rotation was up until recently, sort of off-the-shelf components didn't really give you a way to sort of manage DMA where you could have it be a trust boundary. Uh, that is starting to change, um, in part because of virtualization, but also because people are asking for this as a security feature. Uh, and so it, people came up with this thing called an IO review, which is basically you know a memory management unit that says, you know, you as host as the thing that runs on CPU, you go and program it, and you say, okay, by default nobody gets to access you know uh, DRAM, and then you say, oh, you know, that's device A, and device A can access this piece of memory. And then your device B, well, device B can access this piece of memory. Um, and if you program it right and you do everything correctly, uh, then you can now uh, restrict DMA access and sort of um, create that uh, as DMA as a trust boundary, uh, which is great because all of a sudden you no longer have to trust devices that do DMA. Um, now, with that, of course, comes new attack surface because now all of your DMA partials have to be secure. And because nobody re rewrites these things from scratch, it's always a, a, a version of a version of a version that somebody wrote 15 years ago. Um, your DMA partial is going to be full of holes because it was never um, a trust boundary to begin with. Um, so if you're doing IMU and you're uh, doing it right and you're programming it correctly, uh, go back and look at your DMA code because it's going to be very broken and left tons of bugs. Um, secondly, because um, because you're now basically have this model where it's not map to device by default and you sort of expose it to them, um, you have to not just uh, expose them, but you have to clear your memory before you expose it to a device. Because otherwise devices can now go look at uh, physical pages that you give them. If you don't clear it, you'll be exposing things that are left lingering uh, from before. 
and that could contain things like you know crypto keys or something like that. Um, and then sort of outside the scope of this presentation, but sort of in the back of my mind, I've been thinking about this for months, and, and I haven't seen presentations on this yet, but I guarantee you there's bugs there, and it's hopefully something I, I get to play with in the next months or maybe years, or somebody else will do a presentation about this, which is sort of attacks on the actual IMU use. Um, I, sus I strongly suspect there's bugs there. Um, my guess is you'll find side channels and logic bugs and hardware quotation bugs. I just haven't had the time yet, but it sounds, especially now that we're coming up, we're at the point where DMA is a trust boundary. These IMUs seem a lot of fun to play with. Um, but um, yeah, in terms of bugs, um, here's one that's currently in, in uh, and, and because, so most of the other bootloaders that, I uh, uh, that I've talked about don't support a lot of that new stuff, but um, Tiano Core being fairly mature compared to the others uh, does have support for IMU to their credit. Um, but they have this configuration thing where you can configure it two ways. You can enable bit zero and bit one. And uh, bit zero basically says enable MU during boot. And then uh, bit two, oh, uh, bit one says enable MU when transfer control to OS, which means bit zero doesn't do that. So what this means, is, and you'll see that uh, by default it says one, which means they only set bit zero, which means they only enable the MU during boot. Once they transfer control to the host OS, they turn off the IMU programming, which means now the host OS can re-enable it. But in between those two, you have this window where all your devices now get to, get to DMA into anything they want to. Um, this, yeah, this is a known problem in UFI at the present time. The Intel people are very much aware of it. Um, they are trying to fix this, but the problem is this requires you to design a protocol with host OS where you agree on how you program this thing and how you do the correct handle which at the present time has not been standardized, and because it hasn't been standardized yet, it can't be in the open source implementation, and because everything else is based on the open source implementation, that means everything that at the present time uses the Android port is absolutely vulnerable to this. Um, but in the, they are working on it in the future, this is going to get fixed with a protocol that doesn't exist yet. Uh, cool, this is a... Uh, yeah, and um, just to quickly cover some hardware, um, this stuff is kind of out of the scope of the, of the uh, whole presentation, but we thought it would be uh, uh, silly not to at least mention it to you guys. And uh, what we mean by hardware attacks, we mean things like uh, glitching, side channel, and uh, silicon attacks. And um, this this is uh, really only relevant to uh, you know devices that are in the hands, physical hands of the attacker. Um, things like I don't know, game consoles, stuff like that. And uh, so, real quick, um, uh, glitching. Uh, this is stuff like introducing uh, fault injections. Uh, there's a really cool uh, blog post there uh, that you guys should read. It's uh, from a group called Fail Overflow, which hacks a lot of game consoles. And uh, they recently did a, um, a glitching attack against the PS4 Syscon chip. And um, the idea was basically it would uh, go into an infinite loop. Like, uh, uh, if I remember correctly, no, I don't have uh, debug mode enabled. Sit the sentiment loop and then they would just glitch it, it would pop out of the loop, and then the debug is enabled and they can dump the code and everything. Um, you'll also see uh, other similar types of, of issues like uh, lowering the voltage of a, of a microprocessor or something, where you'll see a, a standard implementation would be a device that will let you program it and then set a, a secure uh, flag. And now that the device is programmed, it could be wiped, but it can't be. Uh, red, so you can do things like uh, tell the device to wipe, but then uh, drop the voltage a little bit, like right after. And um, every once in a while, you'll stumble into a, uh, a chip where you can basically tell it to wipe and then drop the voltage, and it will wipe the, the security bits and then die. You reboot it, and then you can read out the, the secure code. Um, and so, just things to, to be aware of, to look out for uh, things like uh, side channel uh, timing discrepancies, power. Uh, consumption discrepancies, uh, these things, so leak secrets, and um, you, see, you see people attacking hardware all the time in this manner, and uh, extracting secrets, so. And then, um, chipsec. Um, this is uh, more against like uh, silicon attacks, uh, things like decapping, uh, actually, um, you know, making a hole in the enclosure of the chip so you can see the silicon die, uh, using things like a focus ion beam or a, 
uh, scanning an electron microscope. Uh, obviously, attacks like this would be for a, a very sophisticated attacker. Um, but every once in a while, there's people uh, who have equipment to do it. And um, this was like a common thing where you saw people, um, you know, extracting keys out of, uh, you know, the satellite uh, dish cards so they can hack uh, satellite dish stuff. Um, and this is something uh, that people should be aware of. Like, like I said, where people kind of underestimate uh, reverse engineering, uh, the boot ROM will probably be extracted in one of these manners. And uh, so somebody's going to start reverse engineering your boot ROM. So you should might as well audit it and do it right because uh, eventually somebody's going to get it. Um, so uh, kind of our conclusions. Uh, like we said, this covers the tip of the iceberg. Uh, you know, the point of this presentation was not to uh, you know, show a bunch of bugs and laugh and, and flex. It was more to kind of express to you guys the amount of attack surface that's actually there. Um, from the conversations that we have with people, it just seems like people aren't really aware of how much actual attack surface there is. And from the quality of code and the bugs that we stumbled into with uh, relatively low effort, it's clear that people uh, really aren't looking at them. And um, one thing that's kind of silly is you end up in uh, NDA hell really quick if you try to look at um, proprietary uh, bootloaders and boot ROMs and it's just something that you know you're just never really going to get access to it unless you uh, sign your soul away and uh, it's, a, it's a total nightmare but um, but yeah so obviously um, some of the advice we have for people who are designing these things um, clearly you should uh, limit your attack surface and uh, on both your boot environment and your host operating system Maybe you can use uh, Andreas project from the presentation before us. <laughs> and um, you know, turn off features you don't need. Um, there's there's uh, so many times we're looking at a device and, and we go, oh, that's, that's funny, you're using new boot and you have a full network stack, and, but they don't need a network stack, or they uh, you know, will, will mount a certain type of file system that they never care about, never plan on parsing, but, but why is the code there? Um, and then also another concern is, uh, we see embedded Linux with uh, more drivers and attack surface than our, our, our OS at home, or our desktop at home, and it's just kind of crazy to, to see that in, in like a tiny little embedded device. So it's, um, it's just kind of a clean up, clean up what's there, guys. And then um, another main thing is the lack of exploit mitigations. Uh, we pretty much saw like no stack protectors, no dev, um, maybe ASLR in SMM only, but not in outside of it. Um, you know, issues like that. And, and clearly, since uh, Tiana Core is uh, the most mature ones ahead of the game, uh, we put a little GitHub link where somebody went through and kind of uh, demonstrated a lot of these exploit mitigations that are going to eventually end up in Tiana Core. A lot of it's recently been ported, right? Oh, has it? Okay. Yeah, so a lot of it has been. Um, uh, but yeah, it's something that uh, definitely the other the other developers need to start uh, taking note of and, and implementing as well. So um, a little uh, call to action. Uh, basically, if, uh, if it wasn't obvious, uh, more people should be uh, reviewing this stuff. And um, and we hope that uh, you know the the long list of attack surface and the examples and bugs that we showed will kind of inspire uh, some of you to start looking at it as well. Uh, maybe you can go out and hunt for some CDs or something, or, or get some practice looking at uh, this black box that you never uh, thought of looking at before. And uh, people doing basic things like uh, fuzzing various interfaces. Um, basically, everything we found you would have uh, trivially found with some basic basic fuzzing and diff flipping. Um, really, really low effort stuff. And uh, it's pretty clear that uh, some periodic reviews are, are necessary. So, and uh, yeah, that's it. So many boot low bugs dumped in one short hour in my life. It's like we are screwed. Any anybody have questions? I'm sure there's gotta be some. Questions? Now, now, that's the difference between you expected and actually being there. Right, so that's the question. 
among those that you've looked at, how often did that happen? That they would say, you know, if you're supposed to boot on the file system, you can't just modify this configuration and boot. Yeah, that, that's a good that. question. Uh, it, it varies wildly, uh, very wildly. Uh, it usually depends upon. Uh, I mean, if you look at commercial devices, look, at the end of the day, it comes down to budget, right? If you're making a device that you secure boot, it depends how much money you're going to throw around on your security team. Uh, if you're going to skip the money on your security team, you have really insecure designs. Um, if And usually what happens is you start off that way, and they get owned really badly, and then they said, oh, we must spend some money on and hire good people and have a security team. And then, you know, two, three, four, five years later, you build up a good security team, and they start, you know, like putting screws to it, looking at your uh, design and configuration, and things get better and better and better. Um, so, there, I mean, there's some, some we've looked at that over the last two or three years have gotten really good. I was looking at one bootloader uh, about a month and change ago, and they got to the point where um, their bootloader, they sort of made their own sort of uh, Pico kernel and has this a user land that has these tasks that do these things that are the equivalent tasks just doing your bootloader that then just turn their own thing up and then boot the OS. So that to, to get to that level is that's pretty impressive. Some people do that, but it's usually an evolution. You don't start that way. It's just you know you get beaten into submission and end up having to do that. Yeah, I think I think the common trend that we see in a lot of devices is people just trying to get it out as soon as possible, and that is the default configuration. The moment they get it kind of loading, they go, "Cool, we're done," and they and they move forward with it. And uh, so. Uh, Basically, 100% of the time, it's it's pointing out very clear issues as to we're just going to stop auditing this code because you're not even supposed to be using it, or at least we recommend that you shouldn't even be be using it. So, um, as for uh, what we've seen, uh, I don't know, but uh, but at least for in the presentation, we're we're kind of limited to open source projects and default stuff. So, uh, as all the bugs that we showed, the likelihood, uh, severity, who, who knows. Um, it was just more of uh, showing uh, examples of, of each component. More questions? Going once, going twice. Please, a giant hand for these very dangerous tests. <laughs> I, 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 I think that one, 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 one question. Is there anyone left standing? Uh, There's one we haven't touched yet, so I would say those are, there's one, yeah, there's a boot wrong we haven't touched yet because they just would, they wouldn't let us play with it. So that one is still standing because we haven't been able to get to it. So you, you haven't found any that, you, all of the ones you looked at, none of them have survived so far. Not one survived. We're screwed. Thanks.